Estate Investing Profits presents Profit Masters with your host, world-renowned real estate coach and investor, Corey Boatwright. Now, strap in and get ready to learn elite wealth-building investment strategies taught by six- and seven-figure house-flipping masters as they reveal their best real estate investing profit secrets to you right now. Welcome back. My name is Corey Boatwright, founder of Real Estate Investing Profits and your host here on Profit Masters Podcast. How are you doing? I have an absolute incredible investor. His name's Mitch Steven, and he's out of Texas, um, really close to San Antonio. I think it's something Code Canyon or Canyon Lake, something along those lines. And he is someone that I met at the Mastermind for Collective Genius. By the way, make sure you check out uh, that link on our on our uh, show notes here and um, see if Collective Genius is the right fit for you. But Mitch is someone that is a rock star real estate investor. He's self-taught, okay? He's been self-employed since 1996. He's purchased over a thousand houses and this is all around that San Antonio, Texas area. He's only a high school graduate and he just never stopped learning. I mean, he learned from books. You're going to hear an interview. His one of his um, influences, um, you know, were, were just some of the same people that you probably saw in infomercials, and Robert Allen and you know Robert Kiyosaki and you know Carlton Sheets. I mean, literally, he just uh, got inspired by some of these guys and made it happen. So today, he specializes in owner finance properties to individuals left behind by traditional lending institutions, and then he gives new life to properties that scar the neighborhoods. So he's perfected, I mean, absolutely perfected a method of achieving cash flow without having to be a landlord and without having to rehab properties. He has mastered the art of raising private money and the classic no down, uh, nothing down deal, okay? This is somebody that has over 1,100 doors, and that's just on his storage facility. He is someone you're going to want to listen to. He breaks down his strategy and his Profit Master Profit uh, strategy, and you're going to love it. Don't forget, if you haven't downloaded your free investor guide, you can text right now the word profit, and that's 38470. Instantly, you'll get a link so you can download your guide, or you can make sure you click on that link on the show notes. Okay. Here you go. Here is Mr. Mitch Steven. What's going on, Mitch? Hey, Corey. Just happy to be here. What a day. <laughs> I like the hat, man. Yeah, that'll, that'll buy me a house a year. That's really smart, actually. Um, you know, it's I, a 20, I, yeah. It's a twenty, thirty thousand dollars hat. You know, if you go, if you look at it the way I do, that's, that's a pretty great way to look at it. Hey, I appreciate you taking the time to be on here. Um, you're calling in from San Antonio, yes. Uh, Canyon Lake, just outside of San Antonio, but nobody knows where Canyon Lake is, so we'll call it San Antonio. San, San Antonio, all right, Canyon Lake. Uh, I wish wish we could show these pictures of your house. I know you've been working on this, and you sent me all these incredible pictures of your house. Uh, that's where you're you're calling in from today. Absolutely, it is. Uh, I, it's just breathtaking. You're you're literally right on the side of a mountain, aren't you? Yes, I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a short ditty on that. I poured this slab. And when I finished pouring the slab, I had $53.27 to my name exactly and a Volkswagen Scirocco used was my net worth. <laughs> my dad comes down and says, says, uh, you're the you're the pig now. And I got a little bit insulted. I just, what, what, did I build too big a slab or what? And he said, no. He said, have you ever seen that plate of bacon and eggs? I said, yeah, of course I have, dad. He says, well. The chickens involved. The pig is committed. You're the pig today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to be on here, and um, I know that you are um, just knocking it out of the park. Again, you and I met uh, inside the Collective Genius Mastermind, a, a really fantastic uh, group of investors. And one thing I thought was really interesting about what you're doing is you do a lot of uh, owner finance options. Can you talk about uh, what area specifically that you really focus in on a real estate right now, Mitch? 
Sure. I, I mean, I've done a little bit of everything and I'm still open to doing subject twos and I'm open to doing, you know, flipping contracts and all that stuff. But I make my bread and butter and my lifelong endeavor for 20 years has been buying houses, fixing them or not fixing them, and then owner financing them for about double plus a down payment. End of story. Collect payments for 20 years. Collect payments for 20 years. I know it's treated 30 you. Re- 30, that, that's treated you really, really well. What made you want to get involved with real estate in the beginning? Um, I don't exactly know. I mean, the, the infomercials, the nothing downs, the Robert Allen's, the um, Carlton sheets. Everyone telling me that that I didn't need money to get into it, which which is a really easy concept for um, my lips to say and for your ears to hear. But it's a difficult concept to own in your heart. It took me seven years after reading Nothing Down to own the concept that I didn't need money. And now I own it nine ways to Sunday. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you actually came in from a lot of the infomercial stuff. Oh, Dave Del Dotto and you name them. The guys that go way back was Napier, um, Miller, Jack, uh, you know, yeah, Jack. Jack Miller. Wow. Yeah. That's... I'm still, I'm, I'm still betting that's not even his name. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. I, I never got a chance to meet Jack. I've heard so many stories about him. I heard it was uh, he was a legend in himself, but he also had the greatest stories. Yeah, well, if you went, he his his to figure out who he went to dinner with, he would actually have a contest and who was ever going to take him to the most expensive place and buy, and he'd do it right in front of you. Who where do you want to take me? Well, where do you want to take me? Well, where do you want to take me? And believe me, I bought some expensive dinners because I wasn't going to pass that opportunity not to sit down with that guy. Yeah, I heard he was incredibly smart and uh, just uh, just nonstop and would go just forever and ever. Had endless amounts of energy. He did. He was he was a neat guy. Yeah, and we're talking about Jack Miller, obviously a legendary uh, real estate investor back in the day. Um, you know, just an unbelievable guy that taught many people, just like Mitch, on how to invest. Mitch, it wasn't always like this, though, right? Um, at some point. And it isn't always the case with the people that we interview, but at some point, was there a breaking point in your life? Were you doing something before real estate where it was just like something's got to give and then the window of real estate opened up? Was that your story or, or not? Well, it was worse than that. I tried everything else and failed. And this in real estate was going to be it. And then what pushed me over the edge was I was uh, a landlord and I was getting hammered by my tenants and, and they were just killing me. And and I thought, wow, I, I don't know what else to try. If I quit this, what am I going to try? I've tried everything I know to try. Right. And now the one thing that I thought was going to make, it's not going to make it. It looks mm-hmm. like it's not going to happen. And I tried to sell those houses. I had 25 houses supposed to make me $300 a house. So $7,500 a month. Right. And at the end of the year, I quit my, I quit my JLB because I only needed $4,500 a month to live. But I knew, you know, that nothing would go perfect. So I, I went ahead and stayed with my job till I had 7,500 a month coming in. And at the end of that year, I think I lost 500 bucks. I think one of the biggest myths in the, in the planet that they're out there teaching is the rental house myth. Because while I know a lot of millionaires have been made in that industry and I know it's true, Mm -hmm. but they really downplays down downplay that list of liabilities that you're responsible for as a landlord. And they really play up the income, but, at the end of the day, those liabilities are so big that if you're trying to make the spread between between what you're collecting and what you owe, it's very difficult. I suppose the big winners in that business are buying these houses for cash or these apartment places for cash because now I can understand how you could overcome the deficit. But if you're just trying to make 300 clear on a house, difference between what you collect and what you owe, and then the air conditioner breaks, it could cost your whole year for one house, just, just one air conditioner. And so I was a very disgruntled landlord, and I, I tried to sell my houses to get out. And by accident, I stumbled into what I do now. And what happened was I couldn't sell my house. No one in the neighborhoods that I had houses in could qualify for a loan, mm. if the house could qualify for a loan. One of the two couldn't qualify. And so I hired a mentor with the last $10,000 that I had back in 1996, which was back when $10,000 was actually $10,000 maybe. Who was your mentor? Uh, There's a guy here in town. He he prefers to remain anonymous. He's just a quiet guy that owns 500 houses. You'll never know it. He's the millionaire next door. He's the billionaire next door. Gotcha. And and so that's why I don't say. Um, He doesn't want to be known. 
Um, and I gave him my 10 grand and he, and I asked if he already knew the answer to my problem. He solved my problem in like 30 seconds. It was like the fastest 10 grand I ever spent. It was worth it. But he said, Hey, stop being a, a, a landlord, uh, collect down payments from all of these people and then start collecting a payment that's about equal to whatever the rent is. And then you'll start getting your money and start hitting your bottom line because you won't, you won't have any liabilities. You'll be the bank. So I went out and I didn't even believe in the concept. And I collected about $3,000 down from each of my 25 people. Mm -hmm. So do the math. 25 times 3,000. I had 75 grand in the bank. More money than I've ever seen in the bank in my life, personally. And then that $7,500 that was supposed to be coming in every month, it it started hitting my bottom line and there was no more phone calls. It was just, I just went to the mailbox and I picked up my money. Now, not to say that some people didn't get behind and I didn't have to send out some letters, but sure. this was a far cry from having a, to, to do all the repairs and everyone call me every time there's a leak in a faucet and everything else. Right. It's their responsibility. And then the note buyers called me, which was an accident too, because I didn't solicit the note buyers. I didn't know note buyers existed. And they called me and they wanted to give me on average another $17,000 profit per house. Because they wanted to buy my notes, and even with the discount, I was still going to make about, you know, around fifteen thousand per house. So, all of a sudden, after after about eight months of giving this mentor ten grand, I sold all my notes. I had all my down payments. I had collected payments. I had like a half a million dollars in the bank, and 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 I thought, well. How in the world can you do this and not have to wait two or three years? How can I shortcut this run? Right. And I proceeded to buy houses, create notes, and sell the notes, uh, sell pristine notes before the first payment was ever collected, 450 times in a row before associates closed their door. I remember when associates closed their door. Wow. And we called it Black Friday. Mm -hmm. And then I sweat for like two weeks when that happened because my whole way of doing business had just, I thought it had just ended. Mm hmm. And then all of a sudden, after two weeks, it dawns on me, it, it just got easier because <laughs> I used to have to buy the house, create the note, and sell the note. Now I'm just buying the house and creating the note and collecting the payments. Stop right there. Just keep collecting the payments. Twenty thirty. I mean, if you can't live off twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month, I mean, go shoot yourself. <laughs> you know what, Mitch? What was one of your biggest influences in real estate investing? Or who was it? Um, you know. It was really the first guy was Robert Allen because he, he had the audacity to suggest that I didn't need any money to to buy house to bu to buy things and if that was the case I was so broke I could buy the whole town overnight I mean I was so broke <laughs> so I had plenty of that brokenness that he said that you know was perfect for him so he was the it was the real eye opener Robert Allen sure okay so what was one big mistake that you've made or maybe one of your your worst deals that you can think of and how did you get through it. Uh, my worst deals, I don't even have to think. My worst deal is um, I, I loaned somebody a million dollars on some raw land, uh, high-end lots and a high-end house development, which was well on its way. To, I mean, it wasn't like it was empty or anything. There was plenty of million-dollar houses in that neighborhood, plenty. And I loaned it on them uh, with a partner – and the last thing I remember saying to my partner was, you know, this is not what we do because if the lots ever go vacant, like how do you make any money off of them? Right. And um, he says, he said, you know, like what's the chances that we we would own them all? We, it was like 15 lots. And I said, oh, okay. And 30 days later, I owned them all. And the associates, I mean, a, a countrywide filed for bankruptcy in the beginning of the 2008 recession hit. So – for two years, I wrote a check. Me and my partner and I wrote a check for eight thousand dollars out of our pocket for two years before anyone would even walk on anything. I mean, we had signs out, we were advertising, we were standing out there to sell hot dogs for people to look at our lots, and like nobody came by. <laughs> and, and we just stood out there by ourselves for two and a half years, and then we slowly started owner financing lots and selling the lots until four years later, I didn't have a lot left. So that one cost me, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, thank God I had a good partner. Uh, thank God I was strong enough and knew enough about real estate to weather that storm. Mm -hmm. And that I had put during the good times, I'd really put a lot of money away and I had a lot of assets that made money. You know, I also own 1,100 storage doors and they average $92 a month sent to my mailbox at my house. Jeez. So thank God that I put money away and bought assets when I was rolling because when I made this big mistake, if I had not have put 
if I, and you're going to ask me, how did I get through it? How I got through it was I had bought a lot of great assets prior to that one mistake and those assets pulled me through. So the, the good obviously outweighed the bad. And that was just a, a situation where you didn't obviously know all of the details of that land situation and you were expecting it to turn out in a much better, much better situation. But how in the world are you supposed to predict the future of that um, BOA issue? Well, listen, the, the point is I got out of what I was an expert at and I got out of my lane and I wasn't doing what I was great at. And if I'd have been a land developer, I would have known and, and, and the land developers around me would have said, can you smell that in the air if something's coming? And I never would have made this leap. Right. All, all, these lots were all taken down by builders and they were all just trying to get approved from Countrywide. This, this, this one guy had, had got all the builders to commit and they were all just waiting for Countrywide to, to give the stamp. And, and Countrywide kept putting it off and putting it off, and, and, and he was running out of contracts. So I was going to bridge this loan for 30 days for him to get this done, and I was going to make a pretty good chunk. Gotcha. And then 30 days never happened. 30 days never happened. I got out of my lane, and I got run over by a semi-truck. So there you go. You know, I mean, I appreciate you talking about that because there's a lot of wisdom that goes into that. Um, it's staying focused and staying true to what you're good at and not wanting to be a – a jack of all trades, right? Rather focusing on just one or maybe two. And I think we're all guilty of, of being a shiny object and, and going after sometimes the, the lucrative deal that's, uh, that seems really great, but there's usually a reason why it seems great because there's, um, a risk involved in it that either one, we're not really educated to know about. Obviously, in this case, it would be land or two, just the future circumstances that are coming because you're not a native in that market. You, uh, just don't understand it. Yeah. Um, and so I got really good at saying, this is not what I do. And I turn, started turning a lot of things down. And because and also we were in the recession. Right. So, we're, you know, it's still, now it's like 2009, 2010. Someone brings me a proposition to build a, a um, cell tower on my land. And he says, do you want to build it with me? He says, I, I, can, I can buy this little piece of land from you, but do you want to go in with me? And I said, this is not what I do. He built the cell tower. And he rented it out to a couple people for about eight months, and then somebody came by and paid him eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the cell tower. Oh, okay. And I was like, I was like, why? Why can't know, the, why can't it be I, that deal yeah, <laughs> instead of my land uh, deal? Why can't it that be that? Deal? My pick, my picker's broken. My picker's broken. <laughs> What's uh, one of your profit master investing strategies? We we actually bring um, investing rock stars on here like yourself, Mitch, um, that they share specifically what's working for them. I know you shared a little bit of that, but it's a strategy that's really rocking for them. Can you share what that is? One of your best profit making strategies. Okay. I'm going to tell you from the very beginning, and this is the best strategy on the planet. As far as I'm concerned, I've never been able to find anything better. Um, number one, I buy houses based on the rents because to believe in the owner finance strategy, you absolutely have to believe in this statement that I'm fixing to tell you. Do you believe, Corey, that the man paying nine fifty a month for rent would rather pay nine fifty to own? Yes or no? Uh, I think he'd rather pay nine fifty to own. Yes. Yeah, probably not one hundred percent across the board, but probably ninety five percent of the renters out there right. would rather be own. You know, I'd say eighty five percent just to be conservative. Sure. Um, okay, so because you have to believe that all the way through, or nothing else matters, because once. These the majority of the of the renters I'm talking about don't have the choice to go get a new loan. Right. So they're either going to pay the rent for the rest of their life, or they're going to deal with someone like you and me who will give them a chance to own or finance. Right. How, and and why? Means, why are they renting in the first place? Right. There's some cir circumstance that happened why they couldn't own in the first place. Yeah, they, yeah, so so number one, let's say that the I've established the Zillow. Truly a rental meter. The rent is nine fifty. Okay. Then I you know we get out a little chart and we see that. The, the insurance on this home for easy math is going to be 50 bucks a month. And then we get in the, the uh, county appraisal district and we find out the property taxes are hundred dollars a month. So 950 minus 150 leaves us with 800, 800. If you use the terms 10 and a half percent in 20 years, it means a person can afford to finance $80,000 and they'll have an $800 payment plus or minus a couple of dollars close enough. Okay. The other way you can do it is you can take that 800 and you can multiply it by 100. That's how much they can afford to finance. And still, if I'm going to owner finance in this house, can still 
by the time the taxes and the insurance are added on, they're going to be at that 950 mark, give or take a couple. Right. Okay. So I established the owner finance value. Very important that we don't walk around saying the value. When I talk to my private lenders, when I talk to everyone, I say, hey, the owner finance value of this is this. I don't say the value because then I could get in an argument with the, the broker, the sure. BPO, with the appraiser, with the, the CMA. You, you create your own value from this strategy. In, yeah. And, and then you have to go back to that first sentence. Do you believe that a man paying 950 would rather pay 950 to own? 950 rent would rather pay 950 to own. You have to believe this because, see, I was buying houses for $28,000 based on the comps in the lesser parts of town, and I was owner financing them for 69000 on the next day. And what caused the price to go up? It's because I said I would finance it at reasonable terms equal to what rent is. So during the recession, when um, no one could buy anything because the banks weren't loaning, right? So the prices dropped. So I was buying with OPM, other people's money. I was buying these these houses at the low of the low. And Corey, what happens to rents when no one can buy? Sure. You get a, a what premium. What happens to the rents? They well, go up. You get a premium. Sure. Yeah, they go up. So if your owner finance strategy is based, your sales price is based on the rents, what's happening to my owner finance houses in the midst of a recession? Going up. Yeah. They're going up. So I'm buying at the low. It's a perfect storm. So if you do good in the good times, Corey, and you do and you boom like crazy in the bad times, when exactly do you go broke? Never. I mean, you have a great strategy. You have a head strategy. You go broke if you don't have any integrity. You go broke if you don't deal with the Dodd-Frank rules and don't conform with some laws. And you go broke if you over leverage. Right. So let me finish the rest of the strategy. So now we know how to establish because what you – in order to know what to buy something for, you need to know what you can sell it for. So we've established how you get to the owner finance strategy, right? Right. You How you get to your owner finance price. Right. Take so the rent times I, 100. And, and I, with the taxes and, and insurance, you're, you're roughly uh, going to be right around what the owner finance price is. Yeah. So um, you got 950 for the established rents, minus 50, minus 100 for the taxes. You're down to 800. That means they can afford to finance 80000 If they can afford to finance 80000 then what is the price? Let's add 10 to 12% on top. So the owner finance value is 89000 Okay? Period. Now, I want, to, I want a note in my wildest dreams. What is a great deal for me is if I have a note, note that's twice as big as what I have invested. Sure. The note's going to be around eighty. The price is eighty nine, but I want to get like an eight or nine thousand dollar down payment, and I want a note for around eighty. So half of eighty is forty. Right. So that's what I that's what I want to be in this house for. Is if I'm at forty, it's a great deal for me. If I'm at forty five, it's still a good deal. If I'm at forty eight, it's 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 getting watered down a little bit, but it's still good. Right. You know. But I can divide by two really good, Corey. Yeah. So absolutely. Eighty divided by two is forty. That's my benchmark. <laughs> Make it simple. Now here's now here's the greatest plan on the planet. I go ahead and I get it at 40. They sign up for 40. I borrow 42 and I put $2,000 in my left hand pocket, which is tax deferred, right? Because it's borrowed money for right now. Right. I don't have to pay any tax on it till a major event happens. Like someone pays me off or I sell the note. And then I put it up for 89 and someone gives me $9,000 down. Okay. So now I put $11,000 in my pocket and the spread between uh, I borrow this forty-two thousand at eight percent interest only, five years. From just like a local bank or from a, no, a private lender. No, private people. Private people don't ask questions. They let me borrow as much as they want. You see, if I if I actually got it under contract for thirty, Corey, I'd still borrow the forty-two, and I'd put two in my pocket, and I'd put the other ten thousand in the free house fund. And as soon as it mounted up to enough, I would buy a house for cash. Yeah, we call it FHA. So you, <laughs> so we, our free house account, free FHA. House account, free house yeah. So That's my you, FHA fund. so you, so essentially, you max out what you're obviously willing, what they're willing to give you. You max. It's it out. hardly over leveraging, right? If I'm right. gonna, if I'm gonna sell the house for eighty nine, and I'm gonna have a note for around eighty, right. and I borrow forty or forty two or forty three or forty, it's it's not over leveraging, right? right? Okay, so my payment on my money is. Um, Two hundred and eighty dollars a month for the for the forty two thousand, and I'm collecting eight hundred a month. Um, and so I paid myself eleven thousand dollars, right, to create a spread of five hundred and twenty dollars for twenty years. I got paid eleven thousand dollars 
and and then I get to collect five hundred five hundred twenty dollars a month principal and interest, and, I, and that might go up to five um five forty five because I collect P I T I S P I T principal interest P I T I S POTUS no. <laughs> PITUS whatever um it's principal interest taxes insurance and servicing fee a loan servicing fee oh, I always charge twenty I always charge twenty five dollars I don't care if the payment's on time or behind it, it's, you know, there's late fee besides that, but so, um, you charge a service fee. Yeah. Loan servicing fee to myself. I pay myself, you know, you do that a hundred times. That's $2,500 a month. That pays for someone to sit in your office eight hours a day to do more than collect just the payments. I, I would agree with that. So you don't use like an RMLO or anything like that, that you use. No, I'm a principal. Gotcha. Um, now, you know, we do have to use the RMLOs, and that's another conversation, but people have made that conversation really complicated. Like, how do you comply with the regulation of owner financing? Well, it's that's, real I think that's, yeah, a Dodd-Frank is, is a, probably a big concern for the, some folks that are considering this. Great, but this is how simple it is. Hire, hire an RMLO, agree to his price, agree that you think he knows what he's doing, and then um, do what he says. End of story. Let's go buy houses. <laughs> I mean, he's, he gets paid to make you conform, right? So why would you have to study the law and read the I mean, just pay him. He's he's responsible for you conforming. Pay him and go buy houses. I'm on pace. I'm, I'm about seven houses behind pace right now, this minute, to buy 100 houses this year in my town. Wow. And those are now, ones that you're owner financing, Mitch. Well, look, on the way to owner fin- to try to find your owner finance houses, you find houses that don't fit. Right. So I'll, I'll probably wholesale 40% of the hundred. So okay. 40 houses I'll wholesale, which is going to put about a half a million in my pocket. Right. I'm already, I'm on my, I'm, I've already put close to 300,000 in my pocket right now and I'm just getting cooking. Just, just now, from wholesaling. Just from wholesaling. Right. And then you already uh, have like 1100 doors now already, right? That well, is, I have 1100 doors in my storage business. In so your rentals, storage business. That so. average $92 a door. But so but let's stay on the houses. So uh, out of the 100 houses, about 40 houses I'll wholesale, probably make you about a half a million bucks. Um, somewhere around there, you know, give or take a few. You don't have to split hairs on this. You know, whether you make 400 or you make 550, it's all good. <laughs> and then and then ten, about 10% of them or 10 of the houses, I will probably retail, like right with a, a hoteling, right? Because one of the things I don't want to do, when I put out a wholesale house on to, to my list of buyers, it dang sure better be a wholesale, true wholesale, because otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll kill my list. Right. If I want to shoot for the stars or go hotel, I'm going to just do that through MLS where there's no reputation to be had plus or minus. Right. Right. So we, we really work hard at that. When we send out something – Wholesale, it is a true wholesale, right. not overinflated value and deep in 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 uh, decompressed um, repairs. You know, it's true wholesale. Okay, and then the other fifty, I'm going to try to owner finance. So in this model, at at the pace that I just showed you, let's just cut it down a little bit. If I only make five thousand dollars per house, and like, no, that, that's not even going to be the case because I won't I won't let people in my houses that little. Let's say I make seven thousand per house. Is that three fifty? If you I'm, did fifty of them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's three hundred and fifty thousand in down payments, and then let's say they only make four hundred dollars a month in fifty houses. That's another two hundred thousand. Yeah. A month. That's well. No, how much is that a month? Let's see. Um, well, fifty houses times four hundred dollars. Yep. See, and I'm not even good at math, so if I can do this, anyone can. I have to have a calculator. So um, right. that's twenty thousand per month. Twenty thousand a month, right? So that's two hundred and forty per year. So there's another half a million right there in down payments and payments collected per year, you know. And uh, and so you're 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 running at about a million dollar business, you know. And the other thing is, is I've got my system set up to where I have um, I have four people buying houses for me all day long. So I won't get to keep all that 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 million dollars. I'm probably going to give up. Two to three hundred thousand of it to make sure that my people get paid really well, like a hundred thousand dollars a year to right. take care of me. Right. You know, maybe I'll only make six hundred thousand, but I don't have to be there. Right. I'm I'm, I'm buying houses right now. We're talking. I'm forty five minutes away from my market. <laughs> I, I haven't. I've been here all day in my house. Um, I've already bought six houses this month. My goal was to buy two a month. I mean, two a week. Two, two a, a week. week. Two houses a week to to end up around a hundred. We know we're going to have Christmas and some holidays and stuff that we're just not going to do it. Right. So, so that's my plan, and it's real simple. It's very, very, very simple. There is some complication and minutia in the middle of it, but the theory and the concept is very simple. It's not complicated. 
What's one piece of advice that you'd share about running a successful real estate business, Mitch? Learn to delegate. I like that. I mean, it, it, as soon as as soon as you figure out, as soon as you do it for yourself long enough to figure out how it works, and I believe that you have to do it, you have to do it on your own for a little while, so you get a grasp of what th- that part of the business needs or takes. And then, as soon as you can, you have to figure out how to delegate it out. Right. Um, some people that I that I mentor. Um, they live in towns where owner financing doesn't work because, like, if you live in downtown Los Angeles, it's you you, the th- you can't owner finance five hundred thousand dollars houses. Right. Is what I'm talking about, right? Because there's too much interest racking up on too many dollars, and so the end buyer can't afford the house. What's happening in the expensive house is the relationship between the rent and the mortgage payment breaks down, and it's not it's not you can't trade them anymore. You can't trade from one to the other for the same amount. Right. So, um, some of them say, well. What if I go, can I pick another town? I said, you know what? If you pick another town, you'll actually be forcing yourself to create a real business because you're going to have to go there, you know, once or twice a quarter for a year or two or for for about a year until you get all the pieces in place. And then it ought to be able to run right from your phone. And that's what a real business is about. So if you want to really start a real business, then strike up and learn about the owner finance strategy and then go do it someplace that's you can't just drive to in an hour and a half and then you'll have to have a real business. Right. Even at, even at 45 minutes or an hour, it's kind of comforted me because I can get my truck and go there, but I did have to find salespeople and house buyers because I can't just leave this chair right now and go meet someone in 10 minutes at a house. Right. I can't. So I had to get people in place. That makes sense. I, I love the delegation. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's something that's helped, um, helped my business, helped a lot of investors I know uh, be able to get out of the business, work on it instead of in it. If you had to do this all over again, Mitch, how would you change things? And uh, okay, well, well, yeah. I was about to make a comment right in the middle of what you said, but it's, it's the answer to the question you just asked. I was 20 years of flipping houses and doing a lot of houses and working my butt off. <laughs> I mean, banging my head all the time. Now I'm high energy and I had a lot of enthusiasm and it wasn't drudgery for me because I loved it. Mm. But after a while it gets old and I made this decision to go to collective genius and hang around guys like you. And I learned about delegation in that room 15, 18, 20 years later. And I should have got it so much sooner Mm. uh, that, that, that one year with CG with, with you and those guys talking about, Getting doing um, um, uh, moving more product and doing less yourself made such an impact on me that I came right back home and I like crap canned everything I was doing and I started completely over <laughs> with the ideas that you guys had and believe me it was it was painful and it takes a while it took some time to find the right people to build the CRMs to get the 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 computer software and the stuff you needed and and, and you know, wasn't exactly cheap either. And some, sure. and some mistakes I made weren't cheap. But you know what? I, I'm going to buy 100 houses this year, and I bet you I don't see 25 of them. That's great. I love it. I, I would, you know, when I was doing short sales, I would not look at the, I would never meet the seller and not meet the buyer. I wouldn't go to the closing, and it was fantastic. We had a conversation the other day. I was in Maui um, a couple of years ago, and I was really heavy into short sales. And somebody wired over money to me. I got the message from Debbie at the time on my text message and it said the wire just came in and it was just this moment of liberation. I think I know what you're talking about. It's like, wow, this is the way it's supposed to be done. Not working so hard, sweat to your brow when you're, when you're asking yourself, how can I work smarter? I never asked that question uh, for, for a while until, and when the day I did, it changed everything. I wanted to control everything. I felt like if I was doing more, there was more being done. And that's really the, the, that's really an attitude from someone that is not willing to see a different perspective from other people that are doing it better, faster and bigger. And, you know, so it's, it has been powerful to be able to learn the idea of delegation. And obviously, um, the idea of systems. Mitch, what's one of your favorite motivational or business quotes? Uh, there are no great men, just great challenges that ordinary men are forced by circumstance to meet. Who's that by? It was anonymous. They don't know. Wow. Can you repeat it? There are no great men, just great challenges 
that ordinary men are forced by circumstance to meet. I like that. I like that. Uh, I, I think that we're all capable of so much more. Right. We'll just put our we'll just put our butt in the corner and and and, and don't give ourselves a way out. We'll, we'll we'll climb the wall. You know what I mean? I agree. Uh, a, a really really a mentor of another mentor of mine was from Cuba. He got captured in the Bay of Pigs when Kennedy kind of forgot to send the friggin' airplanes, and he stayed two and a half years in. Um, Castro's hotel getting the holy crap tortured out of him wow. for being a traitor to his country. Huh. And that and Amnesty International got him and 2,400 other prisoners out. He'll tell you right now his life is worth a tractor and a box of medical supplies. Jeez. And um, I ask him, how do you keep going? How did you keep going during that time that you were a POW? He said, Mitch, and, and I never forgot this, and I used it in my life to change my life. He said, the human body is the most adaptable thing in the world. And if you'll give it just enough water and just enough protein, and if the mind doesn't go, it'll figure everything out. Hmm. And that haunted me for like a week. And you know what I did with that? I took having a job off the table and said, I live in a free country, one of the best infrastructure in the world. I can do whatever I want. The chances of me sleeping in the rain or not having food are almost nil in this country. I'm taking a job off the table and it's never going to be a choice again. What is my body going to do? And it made me a multimillionaire. Wow. That's, that's incredible. That is incredible. That's awesome. Now, my first day wasn't so hot. I think I made about $10 for the whole day. <laughs> you mean it didn't happen right my, away? <laughs> my, my second day kind of sucked too. And I think I made like $25 my second day. But you know what? Every time I got to an increase in my income, I was the 100% beneficiary of it. Sure. And so when I learned how to go from 20, you know, from $20 a day to $20 an hour to $50 an hour to $100 an hour to $500 an hour, at one point I was worth $800 an hour on a work week, which didn't make my wife really happy on some occasions because my wife would say things like, Hey, honey, could you stop by and pick up the dry cleaning? And I'd say, hey, honey, I'm worth 800 bucks an hour. Can we find someone else to pick up the dry cleaning, please? <laughs> but, but to that's her, it I, wasn't dry, dry cleaning, Mitch. <laughs> no, no, it didn't go over well. Right. But you know what? That's the kind of mindset we started to develop in sure. my family and around me is that we don't mow our lawn and we don't do things that are below our pay grade. And if, and if and, you know, if it's down to where we can't make any money right now, there's nothing to do except the lawn. Then I say, yeah, there is something to do. We need to rest. We need to go by the pool and we need to let someone else do this stuff for us so we can recoup. What's one book that you recommend that would, that's like changed your life? Um, well, there's always, I'm just saying it, all the self-help books I ever read. And I thought, I thought that I was onto these new ideas and everything. But you know what? There was a book written 2,000 years ago called The Bible, and it was all written in there 2,000 years ago, exactly how to be successful, what you needed to do, what your mind had to be. So without a doubt, The Bible is the, is, is the book for me that, that means all the difference to me. But I got turned on to the Bible kind of in reverse. I was reading Think and Grow Rich and um, How to Negotiate with People by Zig Ziglar and all these different books about sure. all these with Maxwell, you know, John Maxwell, everything. And then I was getting my arms all around it, and I found my way back to a church and learned that these guys have just rip, been ripping off a guy named Jesus Christ for a long time. And the cool thing is, is Jesus doesn't care. He wants you to tell him. So uh, some people may not want to hear that answer, but that's my answer. I love it. I, I, it's a lot of integrity, a lot of um, your vulnerability for talking about that. I really appreciate it, and I know others do too. You know, another thing is mobile apps. You know, there's lots of folks that use mobile apps on their day-to-day -day basis. Do you use one every day in your business? I do. I like uh, Google Earth and I like, um, uh, man, there's so many. I'm trying to, uh, I use audio books a lot because it's a way I can double dip, you know, because I got this 45 minute drive just like anywhere I want to go. And then I got 45 minutes to get home. Right. So audio audible.com, um, you know, I, I can take in all the great books I want to four hour work week, pumpkin plan, or, you know, I hear about these great books. and It's like, when the heck am I going to find time for this? But you know what? There's a lot of time in that car that, that you just, you can double dip or when you're working out, mm -hmm. which is, 
something I haven't done in, since 1976 probably, but there's going to be a day. <laughs> well, Audible is more personal, right? More personal development. I love Audible. I also listen to it um, double and sometimes even triple speed to get the most out of it. What what's the? Do you have an app that you use in your business or maybe some of your yeah. team uses in your business? I use Loan Shark just as a simple. I click on the credit card, okay. the credit card uh, a version where there's only four. There's only four variables. You know, the term, the interest rate, the payment, and the balance. And that really helps me in my business because that's I live or die by those four things. And I'm always solving for one or the other, trying to work a deal out. Loan Shark. So, okay. Yeah. Um. I, I would buy the I would buy the four dollar version or three dollar version before the free one, but you know, big deal. Do you have a morning routine, Mitch? I do. It's not probably going to be very popular. Um, I wake up about seven o'clock. Okay. It used to be six thirty, but I wake up about seven now. And um, I lay in bed and I go through all my emails and my texts and all that stuff till about eight thirty or nine, and I take care of everything from my phone pretty much. Right in bed. And then, yep, yeah, don't move. And it, I, I don't think it's really that cool. Um, I don't want to see a bunch of people emulating that. But you ask me, I'm telling you the sure, truth. Sure. Okay. So beyond that, um, do you do you have like do you get up and do breakfast and do your you know shower? Do, do you have to do I something do. that's like pretty similar every single day? I got a lot of things going on, so while I'm doing that, there's being some um, fruit in my in my vitamins and stuff I want to do or my juice, and then um, I take um, I take uh, apricot seeds every day, about six a day. Oh wow! Okay. I, I believe they're proven to fight cancer. They got cyanide in them. Cyanide's the one thing that'll that'll eat the hard shell off a cancer cell. Interesting. Our white, Interesting. Our white blood cells in, our, in, our, in the cancer cell are both negatively charged, so they repel each other. And that I think, anyways, it's it's like six little seeds a day. It's against the law to sell them in the United States, but you can buy them from Mexico. It's not against the law to own them. But they're apric- they cure, apricot seeds. Yeah, because because they cure cancer, you can't buy them here. If if you know what I'm saying. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, let's not go into that subject. <laughs> A um, conspiracy. <laughs> so the, the, here's the it, just short on that. Uh, apricot seeds take like amaretta for about four seconds, and then they turn to the most bitter things you've ever tasted in your life. But if you eat them with a slice of apple, it stays amaretta the whole time. So there's your there's your trick of the day, there's or just the blend them up in your juice or drink. Doesn't yeah, matter. probably blend them up would be. Yeah. A better way. Interesting. Okay, what's a good lesson uh, that you've learned that's helped you get to where you are today? Um, never stop at the first three no's ever. I love that. What are you I most? Never stop. What are you most grateful for? My parents and my family and, and my health. Your parents, your family, and your health. Yep. If you had to hire. A mentor. Actually, a better question is: At what point would you recommend hiring a mentor or a coach? How important has that been to your success? You said you paid ten grand in the beginning. You alluded to that. Would you? That was out of desperation. I got you. But I know exactly what you're saying. I. This is what I do. I drill down on whatever it is I wanted to be from all the free stuff on the internet. I would find all the free stuff. I would search. If you're interested in real estate, then pick all the different strategies. Get all the free stuff, and then when you find one or two that you like, start drilling down on. Gotcha. When you narrow that down to one and you drill all the way down as, as deep as you can go and get all the free you can and you're sure that's the strategy you want to do, then you go pay the guy who's already made you know $10 million doing that last year. But don't hop around a lot because you'll get exasperated and there's not, you know, some of these gurus are charging some pretty hefty dollars, man, 25, 35, 55, 100,000. Right. You know, I know some people in Houston charging $100,000, you know? Yep. You know? Uh, is it worth it? Well, of course it's worth it. If you learn how to make a million dollars, it's a no brainer. Right. You no, know? I know a lot of people that spend 120, 150, 200,000 going to college, get out and don't know how to do a damn thing. I do too. Sure. Yeah, sure. Good way to put I didn't it. Even, I didn't even make it that far. I went to like two semesters and said, you know, it's not for me. Yeah. You made it, you made it further than I did. If you had to summarize it, uh, Mitch, why do you do what you do? Why? It started out about the money in a way to make a living, but you can make it in, in big enough chunks that it mattered that, you know, that, you know, you could see yourself progressing, you know, or being able to progress into some of those areas that you have may have never pictured yourself in, like, you know, driving a Porsche or, 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 or living in a house more like what you dream about, you know, instead of just something to get by. 
Uh, that's how it started out. But then it became about, um, well, one of the saddest days of my life was when I made more, when I realized I had just made more money than I'd ever made, that I'd ever predicted I would make. That was a sad day for you? And then I realized that it wasn't solving my problems, that the problems of the day that I had, that the money wasn't going to help it. You know, at the time, I had a very ill brother who, and who ended up committing suicide and I had a lot of problems. My money, my money is not fixing that. It didn't mm. fix that. And so then I started to get money and living in perspective. Mm. And so now it's not all about the money. Um, it's about uh, having some time, having enough money to do what you want, but also being able to be have, have the time to do what you want. And then also helping a lot of people along the way. I help a lot of people quit their jobs in the last you know, the last two or three years, I've helped a lot of people quit their jobs, find their independence by doing what I know how to do, coaching them and t- telling them how to do it. I don't do it. I don't take on a lot of people. I'm not a millhouse, but I, and I'll, I have pretty heavy interviews to, to figure out if I think the person has the aptitude or the drive or, the, or is in the right place or the right position or the right market to be able to do this. But I've helped a lot of people. And so it's like threefold. I, the money is, you got to have money. Yeah. Then you got to figure out the systems so you have some time. But the last two reasons that I, that I coach or help people is because, believe it or not, I learn a ton from my students. I might bring 100 pieces to each student, but if I had 30 students and they all just bring me back one piece that I didn't know, that's 30 pieces to the puzzle I didn't have that just make me smarter and smarter and smarter. And there's some very ingenious young entrepreneurs out there because we got this new technology and there's new things happening every day. And, you know, people like me, Corey, who, who graduated high school in 1979, who are 54 years old right now, we missed that technology bus. We've been chasing that bus ever since that, the day we got out of high school. Yeah. We've been running behind that bus trying to catch it. <laughs> and then the last thing is, you know, Corey, when, when someone drives or flies from a long ways away just to shake your hand and, and cries to tell you that I just, I, I said, why are you here? I, why did you come all the way here? You know, they said, I came down here to shake your hand. I said, why? He says, cause I just quit my job yesterday and I couldn't have done it without you. That's I just, I said, something incredibly liberating about that and fulfilling, you know, the fulfillment is so much bigger than the money. And I know that that sounds so cliche and in some degree, because someone would say, well, it's easy for you because you've got money or, you know, it's you never been where I've been. You don't know the things I've been through. The challenge is, is that money is a magnifier. It's a magnifies of more who you really are and what you're really about. And if money is going to be the thing that completely drives you, then you'll be a selfish and you'll be a shallow person because money it will go away, right? But time is what you don't is, isn't recyclable, and time is something that if you had an opportunity to buy more of it, you would. But at some point, since we all have an expiration date, we're not going to have any more, you know. And I think sometimes, for whatever reason, maybe it's in your 30s or 40s or 50s, but in their 20s, certainly, I don't think you really grasp how important time is. And, and the limited amount that you have. And you're just just going crazy, pushing it as hard as you possibly can. I call it redlining with my students. And um, I just really appreciate you you sharing that, man, because it, it really means a lot. If there's a way that my audience can help you, Mitch, what would it be? What can we do to serve you? Wow. I don't think I've ever been asked that question before in my life. What can they do to serve me? You know, I, I'm so blessed. I don't know what they can do to serve me, but, um, you have a book that you recently, I'm, you have I'm one on your, word. you got, well, a, you got a book. I, okay. I, uh, if you want to pass, if you want to serve me, you can pass the word about a few books that I have. I have the, my life in a thousand houses series. Um, the autobiographical book, the first book about how a dummy figured out how to make some money. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Uh, it's called called Failing Forward to Financial Freedom. Um, pr- pretty entertaining read. I've been told if you look at the reviews on Amazon and stuff, you can you can get an autograph copy if you order from 1000houses.com, which is 1000houses.com. And then when I put that book out, 
I thought I had said enough, but apparently I didn't answer this one big question that just kept coming back over and over and over and over again. And it is, um, how do you consistently find great deals? So I wrote my life in a thousand houses, 200 plus ways to find bargain properties. Corey, there's actually 250 ways in there because I always want to over deliver. Wow. That's and, a ton. Um, you know, some of the ways, you know, and some of the ways you might not know, um, but either way, this book is going to get your juices flowing and you're going to start seeing opportunities. If you're looking for houses, you're going to start seeing opportunities where you never thought of. I, it I took know. me a lot of years to find these cracks. Yeah, you know, I, I can tell. And I know you're wearing one of the ways that people wouldn't think of <laughs> right on your head. <laughs> That's yeah. a $30,000 cap or $40,000 cap that you're wearing right there. Yeah, that house. Will, I mean, this cap will buy me a house a year at least. Now, what's is that house going to make me 10 grand or is it going to make me 40 grand? I don't know. But whatever it is. It's worth wearing, <laughs> it's worth especially wearing. when you got as few hairs left on top of your head as I do. <laughs> you got to so preserve them. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it makes you some money and keeps your head warm. Uh, that's great. Mitch, I appreciate you taking the time to be on here. Uh, you're close to me, so I'm not going to uh, forget about the invitation to come check out that amazing place and hang out. Um, so I'm looking forward to that being, uh, you know, only a few, few, you know, four or five hours away from good old Oklahoma. And I think it's just powerful. Uh, and just to say to you, man, well done, um, to, to be able to get to where you are, but also to be able to teach it, not just hold it to yourself, not hold it to your best and be able to serve others with it. I think that's the fulfillment work. I really start to th think in life that there's two types of work. One is just kind of you're working in business and you're achieving and that's good. But then there's this other kind of soul fulfillment work. And I, I really feel like um, whenever you're doing things to serve others and you're really seeing them break through their chains and go through um, their, their challenges and you helping them and, and even God using you to do that is powerful, man. So thank you uh, for taking the time to be on here and excellent job. Well, thanks, man, because I, I think you're absolutely right. My, my first achievement was I learned how to make some money and be successful and, and earn myself some time. But I do believe my greatest achievement when I'm done is I, I, is I'll look back and, and, and see that the amount of people I helped and how much I really did help them. And that's going to be my greatest achievement. That's absolutely right. Thanks again, Mitch. Remember, be a servant like Mitch is, a, a servant leader. Don't forget to be on our next Profit Master podcast. Until then, we'll talk to you soon. Bye, Mitch. Bye now. You've been listening to another Real Estate Investing Profits Master Podcast Series. To receive your free real estate book, Down and Dirty, Ultimate Real Estate Investing Quick Start Guide, How to Quit Your Job to Start Flipping Houses in 90 Days or Less, head online and go to realestateinvestingprofits.com. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash realestateinvestingprofits. Thanks again for listening and stay tuned for our next episode.